Welcome to Gold Derby's Meet the Experts panel for film documentaries, and I'm I'm Charles Bright, and I am joined today by Jimmy Chin and Chai Vassarelli, the co-directors of the Nat Geo documentary The Rescue, which is currently streaming on Disney Plus. Um, Jimmy, uh, I'll I'll put the first question to you. Uh, what was the reaction of the subjects to finding out that they might need to be filmed reenacting parts of the rescue? I think uh, they were actually quite excited by the prospect because they're very detail oriented and exacting type of people, uh, as you might imagine, for very technical cave diving. Um, uh, peoples. Um, so it was really important to them that it was represented accurately and correctly. Uh, I mean, I think their participation in the film um, already showed their kind of enthusiasm to to tell their story. But the what we really wanted to get from them was to have them demonstrate what they actually did so that it would you know, very accurately represent what they did. I think for both Chai and I, that sort of authenticity and, and um, accuracy is, is really, really important. And you know, when we presented the idea to them in that way, uh, they were very excited and enthusiastic to take part. I think in mostly also because I don't think any of us could have imagined a non-diver trying to show us what was happening. So, um, and we just felt it was really important to include the actual divers, you know, so what you're seeing um, is accurate, uh, as accurate to the moment as possible. And uh, Chai, I want to direct this next one to you. Um, how did you recreate the Thailand cave for the divers uh, to reenact uh, their rescue mission in? I'm so happy that you asked this question, Charles. Basically, like this film is the first time that either Jimmy or myself, you know, had reenactments or, re or recreations, so to speak. And we inherited a 3D scan of the actual cave from National Geographic because they had this TV show called Drain Your Oceans. It's like scan the, the cave. And it's like for normally for a, a nonfiction doc, like it'd be too expensive. So we inherited this, um, and so we we're like, okay, we've got to shoot reenactments. Because the only reason why we had to shoot reenactments is there's no footage. Like there was, there was something like I don't know, it was like a minute of known footage from inside the cave, and you know there was no other way except for animation to tell the story. So we decided to shoot reenactments, and so we're like, we have this 3D scan. Let's get like so we'll get a fancy set builder, and we got very lucky, and they made the set, and then Jimmy and I showed up in London, in England, like in the height of the pandemic, it was like October, 2020. And, you know, we're like, we'll see our, ca our cave. And we showed up and like the cave is basically five feet big. Like it's five feet long. Rick Stanton is at least six two. <laughs> I'm just saying like, so it was like one of those moments where we were like, oh, okay. Like, what are we gonna do? We, we only had 10 days in the tank. And I have to say that like we worked with this very special underwater cinematographer, who Ian Seabrook, who was wandering around the set at Pinewood where James Bond is happening a few like, you know, meters, like hundred meters away. And he found someone's like old set. Like it was like the abyss. It was like, or I don't know, mummy. It was like someone's like a very big Michael Bay extra piece of cave. And we all looked at it and we're like, oh, okay, now we have three times as much cave, but the real issue was, is it gonna dissolve and disintegrate in the water? Because that's the other big thing about reenactments in water is that, can you guess how we muddy the water and why it's so difficult and like so tricky? I have no idea, please tell me. Okay, well, Charles, like the, you know how you create like mud in, in a tank? You use ground broccoli. Really? I'm not joking. Like, like we use ground broccoli. And the reason why you use it is it's so expensive. Like it takes several days to drain a tank. So if it gets too muddy, you're, you know, you're out of a lot of money. So we're like, okay, we'll put this like someone's cave that we stole or borrowed or whatever it is into our tank and let's hope it doesn't disintegrate and mess up our water. 
so um so that's you know that's how it all happened and it was i have to say like everything about this film like this is the hardest film that jimmy and i have ever made which is funny like after coming off of free solo because that was a really hard film to make but this one like the constraints were so fundamental in a way that there was no there's like very little known footage from inside the cave you know it was the first film we've ever made that we weren't present for the principal action you know there was a global pandemic <laughs> and everybody and knew the outcome of this everyone story. knows what would happen at the same time it felt urgent to us like i don't know as asian filmmakers as parents just this idea that you know maybe we can tell a story about what connects us as opposed to what divides us and i think we can all we all know that the past few years have been defined by division and you know dissension uh so um First of all, I do. I, I I have a feeling a lot of people would probably say that's probably the best use for for broccoli. But I agree. I, would, I agree. I actually I actually like broccoli. So I do too. Uh, I like yeah. when my kids eat it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, uh, how were the uh, one thing that I, I find so I, I that continues to boggle my mind is how were the children and their coach able to survive for ten days before they were actually discovered by the rescue divers? Well, they certainly didn't grow up in Manhattan. Yes. I mean, I think that um, that just their situation in Thailand was such that uh, they grew up um, with very limited means. And I think that sort of grit that you grow up with when you when you live lives like that. Um, and I also think that, I mean, just in terms of kind of the physical science behind the body, you can go, a, you know, that length of time without food, but you can't go without that, you can't go that length of time without water. And so there was some water coming out. Well, obviously the cave had flooded. Wait, of course you'd say that. I'm sorry, it's so extreme when you say that. I know, but it's, it's true. Um, but I, I truly believe that what allowed them to survive was also the fact that the the coach used to be a monk and was going through daily meditation with them to literally lower their heart rates, keep them calm. And in a situation like that, when you're panicking, you're burning a ton of calories. Um, and just psychically, like, you know, you're in a much different place. And by kind of working with the, the, the soccer players and having them meditate and slow down their breathing, you know, that had a huge uh, impact on, you know, I think their capacity to survive. And that is actually, you know, such a big part of the story because, you know, we tried to introduce a lot of ideas that might not be familiar to everybody. Um, and the idea that you know, we all have different belief systems, but who's to say who has, whose belief system is real, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are very real to different people who live in different parts of the world. And so the story about the princess, the story about um, the, the monk that had come to visit, uh, you know, we were introducing a lot of these different ideas because this is a story in a way about East meets West and some of the friction that happens, but also how people kind of overcame these differences in belief systems, ideas, languages to come together um, to save these children. And uh, Chai, what I'm, I'm curious about is, um, you know, usually when you have a story where you have so many different factions coming together to try to do something, there's there's always chaos, but usually it does not end well. And I, I'm curious as to whether how surprised you were when actually diving into uh, forgive the metaphor uh, uh, how the uh, how these different groups of British uh, uh, recreational divers and the Thai um, uh, military and U.S. forces as well. Uh, how they were able to come together, and even though there were rocky points, were able to successfully carry out this mission? Well, I mean, that's kind of the 
part of the story, right? It's like a lot of different types of people, different languages, religions, faith systems, um, ethnicities, you know, came to get like volunteers and professionals, like professional military and then volunteers, like the divers came together and only together were they able to achieve something that truly was, you know, seemingly impossible. You know, and so, you know, there are two things. One, I for like I will forever be humbled and like start getting like emotional every time I talk about it. Is like, you know, these British cave divers and Dr. Harris, who's Australian, you know, they only had something to lose. They're not being paid to be there. They're volunteers. And like Dr. Harris is the best example. Like he's a professional anesthesiologist in Australia. Should he kill one of those kids? He's never going to practice again. Like who's going to want to be like, the, who's going to want to be put under by the guy who killed the kid in the cave? You know, like it's period. And like his wife was really clear, who's also a doctor about that fact, but still, you know, it comes, it becomes about like this idea of like absolute morality, where if you can do good, if you can do the right thing, simply like, why won't you? And I can think of many reasons as like an inhabitant of Manhattan or like, you know, filmmakers who are calculating like that, why we wouldn't. But the point is that these divers, Dr. Harris, like every Thai Navy SEAL, every volunteer, they didn't hesitate. And they took on immense risk to save 13 strangers. And if we all could find that generosity and that graciousness and that kind of selflessness, we'd be in a really different place with the pandemic. We'd be in a really different place in the world. And I think that's why, like, Jimmy, like, this film was, like, impossible. Like, really, there was nothing to illustrate what was happening. And, like, you're like, oh, it's a great story. Everyone knows how it ends. We have no access to the kids. Like, it was, it was like every problem was possible. But it always seemed like it was the right thing to do. And I have to say that, like, you know, I think I can speak for both of us that, like, it, that you know, try, struggling to tell this story, like kind of like using the craft and trying to squeeze the craft is kind of something that sustained us through the pandemic because it was like the right thing to do. It was just like the right thing. Um, we didn't know if it would play out. We didn't know if people would understand it for what it is. But, you know, this is the best of us as humans um, and reminds us of what we, of what we have in common.